thank you very much to the organizers for having me and for the opportunity to speak here. I must admit I'm a little bit scared because as Chris already mentioned, there are only experts, so that's the best place to uh, form pieces. Um, <laughs> So uh, what I want to talk about is uh, trap ions again, and Chris and Kian already mentioned in a beautiful way and introduced the uh, advantages of ions. Of course, there's never a free lunch, but there is a lot of advantages for trap ions and uh, discrete lattice size forms, long range interaction, individual controlled uh, detection. <coughs> uh, this controlled for interaction, I put into brackets because, as you all know, there are different ways to try to scale in size and dimensionality of these systems, but there is most probably not the, uh, a single solution out there so far, and I will try to introduce you to some other option. Before I uh, get into the details of the optical trapping, that will be the topic of the talk, I want to uh, briefly uh, tell you what else is done in, in our group in Freiburg, mainly because I love this surrounding here to open discussions, and it's the best way to get you perhaps slightly interested in what else to discuss with me. And um, we deal also with conventional ion traps, conventional so radio frequency traps, and there we uh, increased or reduced the actual radial confinement in a non-adiabatic way. So we got from linear chains to six x structures, but if you do it fast enough, then the structure, the structural phase transition occurs at different uh, locations in the crystal uh, without knowing each other because the phonons not the speed of light, but the phonons would be responsible for transferring the information from one side to the other. So we get this zigzag and the zag six structure here, and there's a, you might call it topological defect or just call it defect in the center of this crystal. We did a spectroscopy on these uh, defects, and when Chris was talking about localized modes, or local modes, uh, this is pretty much the language also we have to choose for these uh, topological defects, because you can already imagine the distance here between these ions is smaller than the distance should be in a perfect zigzag or zag six structure. And this is kind of a stiffer, a stiffer um, spring constant, and it brings them in higher frequency modes. So you get gap modes in your uh, phonon spectrum, and these gap modes are quite well isolated from the rest of the dispersion relation, it might be more than the commode frequency, and there's the hope of sympathetically cool these modes or cool these modes into the ground state and do something with them. We would like to enter this regime. Here we are currently uh, challenged by the still existing micromotion along the RF axis that is uh, orientated in this direction. Uh, we have uh, another way to go into two dimensions, but we try there to still keep the individual um, controllability of our ions by trying to to, to trap each ion individually. And it might be better to show this in this enlarged picture where you see the surface of a Sandia trap that we have, a triangular trap that is, uh, was performed in collaboration with uh, NIST and Sandia National Labs and also Omar Schmid. And there you see uh, the three individual ions trapped in individual sites with these additional electrodes that allow to control in each individual site the trapping frequency and also the orientation of the modes. And by that, we just recently saw the uh, uh, coupling, the 2D coupling within this uh, mode and with this triangle, so the exchange of phonons between the individual sites. And uh, we also managed to individually uh, drive the trapping sites, so to flocke engineer, to use a buzzword. So, in principle, we just dramatically drive individual trap sites. And by that, onset the phonon tunneling again if the traps are off resonant. So in principle, if the two traps are off resonant, then the phonon exchange is interrupted. If you try it now at the exact right frequency to excite. Ah! <coughs> yeah. That's my mistake. To excite um, <coughs> side pads that are on resonance again, then you can reach this regime of uh, photon or phonon assisted tunneling again. So this uh, was also recently done. And we also work in conventional linear uh, ion crystals uh, here on the, <coughs> in the topic of thermalization. A little bit uh, similar, but also complementary to that what Chris mentioned. We work in the spin boson description of spin spin boson, where the bath is set up by phonons, so phonons being bosons, 
and this didn't be included in the internal state of the eyes. And by that, checking for the local observable of the spin in the spa performance. Uh, quite recently, we did squeezing by now non adiabatically opening our trapping confinement for two ions, and by that, putting the ground state wave function of this crystal into the wrong potential, by that, uh, uh, putting it into an excited state in a squeeze state and measuring the squeezing, uh, there was also beautiful work done at NIST uh, quite recently about squeezing by parametrically driving. We do it here by a non adiabatic uh, opening of our trapping confinement. I should mention, our collaborators too. In the case of the optical trapping, it's Robert Mochinski, uh, Tomza, Oliver Dulieu in the, in the audience, Giovanna Morici. In the case of uh, the two-dimensional crystals, it's Benny Retznik, Hagei Landa, and Alex Retzka. For the uh, triangular traps, I mentioned already Nist and Sandia and Omar Schmid. Diego Porras and Alejandro Bermudez are also uh, close collaborators of ours. You might remember this name from this 2004 paper with Sirac and many other papers, of course. Uh, starting the business of uh, quantum simulations in quantum spin Hamiltonians. And here in the thermalization, uh, you see, uh, uh, thermalization project, you see this, uh, similar names like uh, Diego Porras again. For this squeezing, we have an analogy to pair creation. The squeezing operator is just creating pairs of hormones. So we create great pairs of hormones in this non adiabatic expansion. And there is an analogy be drawn to cosmology, and this is done with cosmologist uh, Olaf Schützholt and his PhD student uh, Christian Fay. Okay, but now, as I warned you already, I want to focus on this uh, optical trapping part. Okay, this is the outline of the talk. I want to the verses here is under quotation marks because it's not uh, kind of uh, trying to find more enemies. It's more to put the optical trapping in the right perspective compared it to IF traps. As we will see, optical traps are much more shallow than IF traps. So it is for experts possible, but for not for everyone that obvious why there's an advantage of having optical traps. Um, I want to show you then how we run a dipo trap. Uh, I call it for atoms with attitude. I think I learned this from uh, John Giverini he said this one. Thing. <laughs> atoms with attitude. Uh, and this is because the neutral atom guy is normally called ions and impurity. And I still can't handle this. Uh, <laughs> um, then I want to show you that we also had Coulomb crystals, in, uh, not yet in an optical lattice, but in a dipole trap. And then this is, let's say, the work of the last two years. And this is uh, quite recent that we saw the onset of sympathetic cooling in the system of barium 138 plus and medium 87 plus. Uh, you all hate your posters that you had as PhD students saying towards in the real time. <laughs> so I replaced here towards, not by onset. So it's the onset, but it's kind of the towards. <laughs> and at the end, I want to discuss some perspectives of the optical trapping, like uh, going to really ultra cold, ultra cooling interactions in chemistry and uh, towards 2D quantum physics in optical traps. Okay. Just a brief comparison, uh, we heard about the advantages. So for 60 years, we have ions and IF traps, and uh, do not forget any traps anymore <laughs> these days. So of course, there's a long history in trapping ions and uh, very well deep uh, traps, IF traps and uh, heading traps. And there is something like 30 years trapping uh, neutral atoms in optical fields. There are a lot of things in common. There are some things in, that are different. One major difference is that typically the electron volt depth of a, a pole trap of the order of uh, 10,000 uh, 10, Kelvin is here opposed by the milli Kelvin trap depth of the traps. So there are seven orders of magnitude in between. So why would, should one still go with ions into these optical traps, optical lattices as well? These trapping geometries are quite versatile and they also offer state dependent, well, uh, state dependent com confinement dependent on the electronic state. And um, on top, one might not have to deal with uh, micron bush in these traps. So that will be summarized better at the end, but just to give you some hope that it's worth uh, uh, listening, or at least that you can decide yourself, is when one thinks about these optical lattices, one might dream of having more than one ion, several ions, an array of ions in an 
optical lattice. Of course, not every lattice I've taken because of the Coulomb propulsion, uh, but one could simulate quantum spin Hamiltonians within these arrays. I would call this the dream dream part. This is the dream dream part because this is the dream part where an optical lattice is filled by atoms, neutral atoms, and just one ion inside this uh, new, uh, neutral environment. And then one could think of, for example, a uh, coherent charge exchange, or the tunneling of charge shared by these ions and atom systems. That has quite some interest, at least uh, for us. This is the dream, dream, dream part. We focus first on this topic here, emerging an ion into an ultra cold bath, like uh, several groups did already, and pioneered uh, by the <coughs> Smith group and Lan and Litich, and didn't have uh, by Flanagan. Uh, in 2009, so we try not uh, to put it now into, uh, uh, or realize this in a hybrid trap, but in an all optical trap, and see how far we can get with this. And now this part will be the part I will try to get you uh, interested in. Some basics in this comparison, when we talk about hybrid traps, there are seminal experiments done in a lot of groups, uh, a lot of people also being present here, uh, Roy, Putting to the ground state and investigating uh, very cold interactions in a hyper trap but under very defined conditions. Um, Rene Gerritsma in Amsterdam now getting with a lithium system. I would uh, say something about this system, this is quite special. Um, also close to the S wave regime, perhaps into the S wave regime already. So there's some hope to also do, or there has already beautiful physics been done in hyper traps, and there will be a lot of prospects for the future too. There's a fundamental constraint in this uh, hypertraps. If you consider here the amplitude of your oscillation and here's time, then you see in principle a sinusoidal motion that would be the movement of the ion in the secular, uh, with the secular frequency in the harmonic confinement. On top of this uh, secular motion, there are these wiggles and these are the micro motion, of course, at the frequency just opposing um, a different sign for the phase, but at the, driven at the frequency of the RF. And uh, this has been investigated by many groups, uh, pioneering once again also the group of Flan and Vulitic, this paper from 2013, that some interesting, let's call it interesting dynamics sets on if you put uh, iron into a hypertrap so in combination with atoms. Uh, the reason is that even if you consider the iron being a classical particle point size at zero temperature located at the RF null, so in principle, the ideal starting point. If you come close with an atom, the ion polarizes the atom, so they get an overall R to the 1 over R to the 4 potential, and then within this 1 over R to the 4 potential, the ion gets displaced from the center of the trap, and the RF gets a hand on putting energy into the system. And this puts a fundamental constraint on the temperatures that can be reached in these systems. It's advantageous to look for mass, uh, mass ratios between atoms and ions that are favorable, for example, if the atom is very light mass, like lithium, then it cannot displace the ion by that much, and therefore the uh, input of energy is not, this is in a nutshell, but pretty much that is uh, covering a lot of the physics responsible for the fact that perhaps with lithium and very heavy ions like terbium or barium, one might also do beautiful uh, S-wave uh, physics within the systems. They are also other proposals that are about Rydberg excitations and so on, so it's very hard to get something that could be generic, and we will try to get something generic. And for that, we want to set up this optical dipole trap for ions. To get you into the protocol, what we still have to do is we run a pole trap in our apparatus, and we run it for the preparation and the detection. So only in this part here, there will be the purely optical part. So why do we still need this pole trap? Because we load into the pole trap and we Doppler cool the Doppler cooling limit. Uh, in former days, it was millikelvin per magnesium, now it's 360 microkelvin for our barium ion. And we compensate spray fields and do all these preparation steps. Uh, then we switch off the dipole trap, uh, we switch on the dipole trap and switch off the pole trap. We can switch off the DC, and we need the additional axial confinement, but we keep in, uh, knowing the DC on because we have additional control on the position of the ion like that. And then we store the ion for a certain while, and after that we switch the pole trap on, the optical trap off, and do fluorescence detection. And if we uh, see here still an ion, we consider the optical trap being successful. We can also do temperature measurements, and then we'll do, uh, uh, I will 
try to introduce this to you in a second. Okay. So some uh, aspects of this preparation include, for example, spray field compensation. And and here it is important that it's not only spray field compensations, ions have an attitude, so they are different. <coughs> There's a lot of beauty about long range interaction, but they are, of course, different behavior to neutrals now. They are very sensitive to stray fields. They see from DC fields that we apply a defocusing effect. If you consider Ehrenschel theorem, Maxwell equations, you can't confine a particle by 3D, 3D by DC fields. As a consequence, if you apply a DC field in some dimension, you will have a defocusing effect. And you have to overcome with your optical forces now the defocusing of any residual stray field or control field or whatever you have. If you want to have or want to deal with more than one ion, you have the Coulomb interaction between the ions. And the Coulomb interaction also does the defocusing. If you think about the linear chain and the zigzag, it's pretty much the same. If you increase the actual confinement, then the ions get into the uh, radial direction. They extend into the radial direction. It's pretty much uh, reducing of the focusing in the radial direction due to Coulomb interaction. And uh, I shouldn't put this in the same uh, in the same uh, list here, but there is also the difference. It's not a difference compared to the neutral people, but to normal ion trappers, we normally confine particles uh, and calculate secular frequencies by the charge to mass ratio. Uh, here we are all of a sudden state dependent, state dependent on the internal electronic state. And we get also dependent on the beam shape. So if you think about a dipole trap, a diversion beam has different intensity along the axis and therefore different confinement along its axis. So we compensate our stray fields currently by using the AC star shift and got a very sensitive method of leadership design. We uh, got a, a nice method to compensate our stray fields. We focus our laser beam on the ion, get with a second laser fluorescence detection, and if the focus dipole laser, focused to a micron or so, is uh, putting the ion into, uh, by AC star shift, out of resonance, we see less fluorescence. We then open the confinement in the pole trap. We open the confinement. The same amount of stray field displaces now the ion further. So shifts it out of this uh, dipole uh, beam, so out of the AC star shift, and the ion gets fluorescent again. And then we can push the ion back and compensate by that these stray fields. And doing this several times in an iterative manner, we compensate our stray fields to a level of 5 millivolts per meter. We could go even further. We might uh, get even below 1 millivolt per reader, but currently we don't need this. It's more than related to shifts and drifts. Is it kind of a real time adjustment, or it is made forever, this, this kind of... Uh, ah, okay, <laughs> this is the systematic <laughs> drifts that I'm talking about. If we are talking about something like 5 minutes, then we can get it to this level. Uh, more than 5 minutes, we drift. so then if we do the very sensitive experiments, then I will very <coughs> uh, if we do our uh, benchmark experiments, we are compensating every minute. The nice thing about our shift is the systematics is kind of predictable. It's not a fluctuation, <coughs> but it gives us a slope, and therefore we can compensate with feet forward already far into the future. Okay. Uh, there might be ways to do uh, this even in a smarter way. Um, I think it is. Uh, I have to now think about this even better because uh, you are in the audience in DD2 because uh, using squeeze states one might increase even the sensitivity of displacements on, uh, of, of ions or emotional excitation and one might be capable of uh, implementing these methods on top to even get more sensitive to emotional excitation. Okay. But these are DC displacements, right? These are DC displacements, yeah, but still it's DC displaced and if you open and close you get all the emotional excitation. Uh, so if you do this in a fast way, so let's say you, you drive this, let's say, on resonance frequency of your, of your eye, you get by this uh, stray field displacement and excitation with this excites the motion. And that might make you more sensitive if you use this, because a small displacement can be amplified. <coughs> we are currently limited uh, to this level. Other things you one has to take into account, and we did this in collaboration with John Namorici, that we still have to consider the charge of the ion compared to atoms. Because there's still the desired detection of the electromagnetic field with the charge. And therefore, there's still something like micromotion left, just at 10 to the 14 hertz, not at uh, 10 megahertz anymore. And this is fast enough to 
reduce the mic motion amplitude by many orders of magnitude to make it negligible, let's say, at least uh, in the order of magnitude that we are interested in. Well, of course, one needs sufficient compensation of stray fields. And then switching these RF fields off and on again, and also the DC fields, has to be done with some care, because the switching off your RF watches does a scan of your quadruple mass filter. And a scan of your quadruple mass filter, in principle, leads to the loss of your iron, of every charge to mass ratio you will have. So doing a complete scan means switching your thread off, you will get with your iron out of this uh, diagram of stability. Um, and it's even worse because the diagram of stability does not mean that you are stable inside and nothing outside. It's even instable outside, so you get repelled. So you have to do this fast enough to get around resonances and uh, evil excitations of your ions. But of, on the other hand, you have to do it in an adiabatic way because you want to hand over, transfer the ions from the RF trap into the optical trap. Let's assume they are not perfectly uh, overlap. Then if you just have the ion in the RF trap and switch it off in the optical trap, you have, of course, a huge excitation. So you want to switch it off adiabatically to hand over the ion in an adiabatic way to this new trap feed. So doing all this, and starting with magnesium, uh, that was still at the <coughs> we uh, uh, got an optical dipole trap for magnesium 24 plus and uh, trapping a single ion in an optical lattice. And this has been done in parallel also in the group of Vlad and Vulicic and Mikael Pilsen, uh, according or with respect to the actual confinement being a standing weight. In the radial and degree of freedom, they still um, have radio frequency confinement. So we did this in an all optical setup with advantages and disadvantages. This is just the main difference. We then uh, switched to barium 138 plus and to a more detuned strap. We got the scattering rate reduced by a factor of 1,000, the heating rate reduced by four orders of magnitude. But the trapping duration was still, uh, well, these days it was the straight compensation limited here, but we still got milliseconds uh, lifetime only. We were very proud of that. But of course, milliseconds are perhaps not the duration for all the experiments we envision. So why there was still this lifetime of milliseconds, if you consider now the uh, very simplified electronic level structure of barium, you see here the S1F ground state, they are the P states, and they are the D states all of a sudden. They don't exist for the rhythm of barium, at least in between the <coughs> states, but for the higher mass uh, ions, they sneak in between here, and with a scattering ratio, you can populate these states. If you consider now the 493 nanometer direct cooling transition and a 532 nanometer trapping beam, then you are producing a nice uh, uh, rapid tuned laser for the ground state, but getting in the D state, you see the repumping wavelength of the order of 650 nanometers is now longer wavelength than the trapping laser, so these states get newly tuned. So if you scatter in these states, you even repel your ions. Can make a feature out of it because you can then stay sensitively select whether you trap or not. But for this laser, this is uh, of course mm -hmm. not a trapping laser anymore. If we shine in an even further detuned laser here, the near infrared laser, 1054 nanometer, then this laser is detuned to the red of this transition and to this transition. And so we get um, uh, confinement for both electronic states but with a different uh, strength. So this is uh, roughly 25% only of the confinement in the ground state. We see already something that is, we call a micromatic trap because there is a visible uh, beam and the near infrared beam focused in the center of our ES still indicated pole trap and uh, the barium ion sitting in the middle. <coughs> With this approach, we, we sh you shouldn't focus too much on these numbers here. One number that is still of importance is that we use quite a huge power, 20 watts, on a waste that is only 5 microns. The reason why we have to start these, with these high intensities is that we start only Doppler cooled for our ions. So having something like of the order of millikelvin temperatures means you need several millikelvin steps of your trap to keep a boson distribution inside. So we will, or we are working on uh, reducing the temperature here, and reducing the temperature also means reducing the intensity. Using these parameters here, we. Here you see the optical trapping probability I introduced to you beforehand. So the probability to still have the ion in the pole trap after the optical trapping step going up to 100%. Here, independent on the trapping duration, now in seconds. And even so, this is a very poor man's approach of a fit. You might see that this is, well, 
of the order of seconds or even longer lifetimes. So this is quite nice because this is the order of magnitude that you also get for neutral atoms under similar traffic conditions. So this is not the main bottleneck anymore. And on top, as I said, we get this date-dependent confinement now. So here we can prepare deterministically to be in the step in this state. And uh, doing so, we control the confinement of the ion. Okay. Very briefly about the Coulomb crystals uh, in uh, the optical trap. Uh, and there is some arguments come sneak in again that I already mentioned. So we have to now think about the fact that we have DC fields. So if we want to have DC actual confinement, we will have a defocusing effect for the ions. We have now the Coulomb interaction between several ions, and we also have to consider the field geometry. So we have the waste here in the center, but the smaller the waste is, the larger the radial length gets. Uh, the shorter the radial length gets, sorry. So typical uh, values here is for, for example, six ions, a length of 135 micrometers of a linear chain and pole trap. And if we overlap this with our beam, well, then the radial length is uh, shorter than the length of the crystal. Since the intensity goes down the further we go out here, the optical potential goes down, and also the secular frequency goes down. So and you see here, <laughs> this is uh, to scale, the, uh, the tiny trapping confinement is quite steep, uh, deep here, the tiny trapping confinement that uh, remains here for the fifth ion, or the third ion on the side. Um, also, and this is something that is of importance when we go to the sympathetic cooling, if we go to small foci, we have some interference effects there, the beam shapes are not optimal, so they are not perfectly Gaussian and so on, so uh, going for these uh, small wastes is most probably not the best uh, avenue for the future. So for uh, keeping the ions now in the optical confinement, you see here the picture we take from the ion crystal from one to two, three, four, five, six ions before optical trapping. Here the double laser is on and the <coughs> RF is completely off. And here you see the detection of the crystal after all. And for one, two, three, up to five ions, you get 100% trapping probability, close to 100. Getting to this six ion crystal, we drop down to 20% because then we explore the, uh, the laser beams that are already being used <laughs> quite too much. What might be interesting is that we also can synthetically cool. Here it's not molecular ions so far, it's just a different isotope but we can sympathetically pool these uh, uh, different isotopes and also keep them in the optical potential. And what is something that made us uh, hoping that we also have a crystal within the optical dipole trap was that these uh, dark ones didn't change location during the optical trapping. If something would really melt, one could expect the particles would change place. It's of course not true if you have a liquid where still the particles can collide and don't change place. So we did thermometry on the ions and also phonon spectroscopy <coughs> in the optical trap. And we saw that the phonons stay alive. So for the two ion crystal, for example, the stretch mode is excitable in the optical trap, so there must be a crystal. And on top, we uh, see that the temperature doesn't rise above 1, 1.5 millikelvin. So this is well below the crystallization temperature. So we are close to sure, even though we don't <coughs> see the ion crystal within the dipole trap, we are close to sure that we have Pull of crystal within the optical dipole trap. Is, is, is there a hope to see the ion crystal in the dipole trap, or is that yes. out of the question? No, it's not out of the question. It's, uh, if you consider just the AC star shift and if you detune then your detection laser, it should be feasible. On top, it should also be feasible to do this in a stroboscopic way, so to switch on and off the dipole beam. Doing this fast enough would allow you to just reduce the, the the trap, depth, uh, the trap depth by the, the effective confinement. <laughs> Meanwhile, there would be enough time to do some fluorescence detection of the ions. Uh, we didn't do this. So What's the oscillation frequency of the ions in the trap? Once again? What's yeah. the oscillation frequency? Okay, of so the trap? roughly it's something like 100, 200 kilohertz in the radial, 2 pi times uh, 20 kilohertz in the radial direction, and something like uh, 10 to 15 kilohertz in the exo direction. So the onset of the sympathetic ah, onset of the sympathetic cooling. So in principle, on a piece of paper, it now looks quite simple. You have to choose uh, your two laser beams, so for the bicomatic trap, the one laser giving you confinement for the barium ion, 
the second laser also giving you confinement for the barium line, but deconfinement for the rubidium. Why? Because the rubidium is resonant at 780 nanometers. So putting, for example, a 532 nanometer in between is confining the barium, but blue detunes with respect to the rubidium. This gives us an additional opportunity to do some uh, individual control because if we increase now the infrared laser that is uh, responsible for the confinement of the rubidium, we can get the rubidium and overlap with the barium or reduce the density of the rubidium in the center of the track. What would just work nicely with beam waves of the order of 25 micrometers, 16 micrometers somewhere, dependent on the, uh, on the wavelength. So in principle, one might think now just putting everything in this phytomatic trap leads you to a night in a cold environment, getting cold. Yeah. Well, there is no free lunch. We have to think about some uh, difficulties. Uh, one difficulty is, well, that we so once again, of course, have to think about the straight field compensation and the EC confinement. Here are your 11 kilohertz uh, in the actual direction given by the DC confinement. And you see here the for the barium plus, the infrared laser, the green laser adding up to the blue confinement, but then by the spray fields and the DC confinement, we get this trap depth reduced and also um, asymmetric because of the spray fields in that uh, preferred direction. So we have to consider this, and this is not the case for the rubidium. For the rubidium, we have to balance now very carefully that the visible laser is repulsive, and so the infrared laser has to overcome this, but the overall confinement for the rubidium should be still tiny because we want to have a cold cloud of rubidium, not just a very dense hot cloud. So we did this by evaporative cooling the rubidium, the barium starting at Doppler temperature, and still with very small beam wastes, so the four micrometers. And this is our main bottleneck so far. Um, one uh, additional difficulty is, if, even if we match now the right laser intensities, we also have to switch them on and off in, a, in the right ratio keeping the ratio fixed. Why? If we, for example, and here you see a control plot of the optical potential, if the visible laser, for example, is ahead, it repels the uh, rubidium atoms already and therefore pushes them out of the optical trap. If we have the near-infrared laser ahead, it's too strong confinement, we compress the rubidium cloud and therefore heat it up. So the ratio has to be kept constant, and this is pretty much what you see here, it's looking from a side, you see here the atoms being just in these two lobes, not in overlap with the ion. So the ion would sit here in the center, and here's this explosive uh, horizon of the atoms just getting lost. If we do it sufficiently constant, in a sufficiently uh, a constant way, then we keep the atoms while switching in this confinement at the right temperatures and density. On top, we have now, during the loading phase, a lot of light on here in a mod and also in a dipole trap. And so there's light present, there's rubidium present. So there's the possibility to breed rubidium plus ions and the possibility to further breed rubidium two plus molecules. Well, if they are created, they disturb our barium plus ion, heat it, heat it up, and disturb the optical trapping possibility. So what we have to do is we have to displace the ion from uh, the cloud and also from the trap center and to run uh, parametric excitation pulses for the rubidium plus and the rubidium two plus during the loading phase. Because if not, we see here the trapping probability independence of the trap depth. And please look for the uh, first on the squares. We see the trapping probability close to zero if we don't run this purification pulses. If we run the purification process, you see here the onset of the optical trapping, allowing us to extract the temperature with this temperature cutoff model. So think about the Boltzmann distribution. If you have a certain trap depth, you cut off everything of the Boltzmann distribution that is above. So you just keep the part below. And thinking about that and shifting this uh, trapping potential allows you then to extract the temperature out of this curve. And zero temperature it would be just a whoop step function. OK, so and here we climb up once again. At decent temperatures, so Doppler temperature, up to full trapping probability. But I have to warn you, this is just 80% of the trapping probability. This is not uh, a heating process, because we still see also in uh, more resolved measurements that the temperature stays the same. This is a loss process, most probably, because here the RF trap is still on, and these ions, the rubidium plus and the rubidium 2 plus that we excite, are partially still on higher orbits and still disturbed. 
and this just costs us 20% of the cases so far. Uh, in addition, one has to be careful when can purify also ion crystals, but the frequencies are different dependent on uh, whether the ion is in the ion crystal or whether it's in a cloud and where. So we have to do sweeps over these uh, frequencies to get rid of these parasitic ions. I just wonder, I mean, you have not probed that it is rubium 2 plus rubium plus. It is just interpretation of what you No, we probed it. You probed it. Because we can, if you trap and you pole trap for a longer period of time, we can okay. then cool them again and do here frequency. Okay, so this is helpful with the pole trap. Okay. Yeah. This is all still in the pole trap. Right, okay. And just the temperature measurement at the end is done in yes. the optical trap. But this is expected you just put it in the right direction because, of course, now you want to know what is really in the optical trapping phase. Here we extract the Doppler temperature for the barium once again. Doppler temperature would be 360 microkelvin, so this is 356 plus minus 30 microkelvin. And so <clears throat> one could go into detail here with this uh, laser powers of the near infrared, the visible laser, the ex uh, additional uh, DC fields that we need for displacing the ion, getting in the close to the cloud again. Here doing the Doppler cooling for reaching the Doppler cooling temperature, then placing the ion inside this cloud. Uh, temperature right now 30 microkelvin of 500 rubidium ions. And then we switch DRF off. And you see here preparation, pre cooling, that is this phase. Then we do the overlap. Now you are here. And then we do the bichromatic graph. This is the screen part. And this is when we switch DRF off. And this is what we observe DRF graph switched off. You see here, and please don't be confused by using red and blue in all different combinations. <laughs> so it's all indicated and all wrong if you try to make sense out of it. So what you see here is the trapping probability. Once again, it depends on the trap depth. And you see these blue points. Let's consider the blue points first. And these blue points are measurements taken without rubidium presence. So we run a complete protocol and just at the start of this optical overlap with bichromatic trap, we push them away by a resonant push on the S to P transition of the rubidium. And then we measure the temperature of the barium ion in the purely optical trap, and we see that we once again get our Doppler temperature of the barium. So the barium is not affected. We also end up at this 80% trapping probability again. So the transfer is also close to good. If we do the same now with our cold rubidium cloud, we see that we lower the temperature by 100 microkelvin. Okay, you might say this is not ultra cold, and you're completely right. This is why I get you now to the current limitations, and this is why it's only the onset. What we can get is, on average, one collision of these. We can calculate that at the densities we have, the rubidium densities, 5 times 10 to the 11 per cubic centimeter, the Langevin rate is roughly 1.5, 10 to 3 per second. So this gives us, in this millisecond that we have, so the optical trapping times are in principle seconds. We only have a millisecond, so you might ask, why aren't they waiting longer? Why aren't they cooling better? Yeah, so here are the double minus signs that we have to cure. One double minus sign is that we still have photo-assisted breeding of rubidium plus and rubidium two plus in this optical confinement during the overlap. And during the overlap, we are not, or in the optical, <coughs> we can't run our purification process anymore. So we have to reduce the optical power. Or it should be easy if we start with the ion colder, or if the ion is already a little bit colder, we should be capable of reducing the trapping confinement to keep it. We have beam pointing right now. We are doing an interesting task. We are focusing two laser beams from the left and to the right into the chamber with four micron waste. You might say we really should come in from the same direction to get rid of uh, common uh, beam pointing, for example. That gives uh, rise to uh, heating effects. You are perfectly right. Uh, we will work on that. In addition, uh, we have the difficulty that now that these laser beams are fluctuating a little bit, that the density of the atomic cloud is fluctuating. You remember this shallow optical confinement for the rubidium atoms? If the lasers now fluctuate, the density of the atoms and the spatial location of the atoms fluctuates. We want to work at much lower densities because three body losses play a huge role starting from 10 to the 12, uh, 10 to the 12 per cubic centimeter. By these fluctuations, we increase the density briefly, and by that we get these stupid three body losses on top. At least we speculate that we have this. What we want to do now is, just a second, we, uh, what we want to do now is to reduce the density of the atoms to go for longer trapping durations because the um, three body losses uh, uh, scale with the density to the square, while the normal losses scale like the density. 
So going to lower densities should allow us to get rid of these three body losses. To be honest, with the mass ratios of roughly two, a single collision should still be rather efficient in sympathetic right. cooling, right? right? So it's single collision is could work could work better, I guess. I mean, okay, I just want to thank you for the nice comment. Yeah, it could work better. Thank you, Roy. <laughs> so, yeah. I if I hadn't said it loud enough, also for the audience outside, we didn't. Yeah. Um, as a summary. Uh, what we did is uh, we got a bichromatic trap for barium. Uh, we have three seconds strapping duration, two comments. This is in the 1064 nanometer trap. If the visible trap is on, the trapping duration, of course, is reduced. We can do some repumping, but one has to be careful and not confuse the trapping duration or the lifetime with the coherence times. Because if there's a scattering process, of course, coherent processes might get stopped. The coherence times are of the order of 100 milliseconds. We have cooling crystals in a dipole trap. We saw sympathetic cooling there. Phonons are available as a degree of freedom for all nice quantum gymnastics on my Primo. And one might think or dream about 2D crystals uh, without uh, RF being present. So and we saw the onset of sympathetic cooling. How much time do I have left? Zero minutes. Zero minutes. OK, then this is the right moment for the outlook. Uh, we also have a setup for lithium-6, really one. Look, OK. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we have a setup where we also try to do this with uh, lithium and want to look then at the impurity physics in BEC, so the formation of uh, mesoscopic clusters. Uh, yeah, so I can skip this and hope for your questions. Uh, the, the, here we might dream about feedback states to get larger of the atoms, to get larger extensions uh, for increasing the electron tunneling. And just something that I want to mention because uh, it has really some beauty to work also on this uh, state-dependent confinement. If you think about this uh, uh, phase transition uh, from a linear chain to a zigzag, you should get, if you're not disturbing the system, starting from three ions, says Giovanna Morici and uh, uh, Martin Plenio, there should be the onset of superposition states that are obvious in, uh, in ion traps. And if you then do this with the coherent superposition state of your barium, let's assume, for example, this being in the S state and this being in a uh, superposition, uh, or being in a superposition of the S state and the D state, the D state is weaker confined, so we should get a coherent superposition or an entangled state across this phase transition between linear chains and a zigzag structure would be eager to see, so it's only three items. Okay, with that, I want to thank very much uh, the patients of this chairman and mention. Leon Tarpa being the uh, leading assistant on the Tiamo project, Markus Debatin on the Bali project, and Ulrich Waring being a permanent uh, uh, collaborator of mine. Pascal Beck is up, uh, Fabian Thielemann are the PhD students, Julian Schmidt will be with Didi uh, quite shortly, and Daniel Wünig just started our group. Thank you very much for your attention and your patience. We're really running out of time, so maybe one burning question, or we can make a lunch break. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can you quickly say something about the bar lifting, how it compares to the ah. video? Okay, just very briefly as appetizer that we continue discussing. So it perhaps uh, quite fine, we need more collisions in the lithium system. It's a uh, smaller mass, so we need also more collisions. But it, we see already sympathetic cooling in the, in the hyper trap. And so we think we can start colder already and reduce the intensity so that should, might work fine. Thanks. All right, thank you very much. See you. Thank you very much.